Hello and welcome to LEMF's uh, webinar commemorating the centennial of the Greek-Turkish Mandatory Population Exchange. My name is Ioannis Grigoriadis and I'm the head of the Turkey program at LEMF. I'm also an associate professor and Jean Monnet chair in European Studies at Dilken University in Ankara. And I'm very honored uh, to moderate a discussion today on an event that has profoundly shaped the destiny of the Greek and Turkish people as well Greece and Turkey. Uh, it, uh, it is very hard to overstate the significance of the mandatory population exchange between the two countries that was agreed exactly a century ago. And uh, today we're going to have a discussion in two panels trying to explore the political legal aspects of uh, the population exchange in panel one and the cultural historical aspects of population exchange in panel two. Each panel will, uh, have, will last for about 60 minutes. So we will start with panel one. Uh, in the panel one, we'll have Professor Ryan Gingeras, who is joining from California, a professor uh, uh, in, uh, in San Diego. Uh, professor Bantis Kanzi will be joining us from Athens, uh, from the University of Athens on the Department of History and Archaeology. And we also have Professor Mut Ostu from Caltech University, who is an expert on the legal dimensions of population exchange. What we will be very honored to have uh, the beginning of this event with some opening remarks by one of the most eminent scholars in the field of studying the population exchange between Greece and Turkey, Professor Rene Hirschon, who is a senior fellow at St. Peter's College, University of Oxford, and who is also uh, a member of the advisory board at CSOX, St. Anthony's College, University of Oxford, will be speaking in the beginning uh, for the meaning of this event, both in Greece and Turkey, as well as on its ramification on Greek politics, history, culture, and Turkish politics, history, and culture. So I'm very honored to give the floor to Professor Christian. Thank you very much, uh, Ioannis. Um, I think you mentioned that this is the date on which the Convention of Lausanne was signed, the 30th of January. So we've actually hit the exact 100 uh, from the time of the signing of this convention. Um, I was invited to, I understood my brief is to try and introduce both panels by showing the, the complementarity between the convention, the treaty, and the various uh, impacts that were created through the exchange of populations. This means that my um, introductory remarks are going to be accompanied by a PowerPoint um, because there's so much material, I certainly wouldn't want to try and compress it by talking to it. But even so, it is going to last um, up uh, probably about 15 minutes, and I hope that that is okay with your timetable, Yanni said. I didn't have a, a guideline as to how we long. Can, we can manage if it is no longer than 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so we can then start, I can launch into my presentation um, and point out to you that there are three sections to what I'm going to say, three separate sections and a section on conclusions. The first section is the overall context, um, which consists of the political uh, dimension at the period of the, um, the Lausanne Treaty, uh, which was a follow-on of the First World War and the Paris Peace Negotiations. The second section is the legal context, and the third section is the regional context. So if we just try and follow it by looking quite quickly through what I've written up here, is that, um, of course, we all know there was nation state building, there was the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian and the Ottoman empires. And the reasons were Balkan nationalist movements. And the fact is that what the effects were that there were mass population displacements at that period. There was a specific political aim and there was the factor that not need, we need to take into account was the fact that the minority groups were not protected in international law. This is because international law was underdeveloped. The League of Nations itself was an incipient institution, 
It was not supported by the US. And that at the time, the context of international law was relations between states, not based on individual human rights. That's quite an important change from the prevailing um, atmosphere in which we are living nowadays and which developed before and around the Second World War. Um, the overall context we also is the regional context and the regional context that, that we need to flag up here is, of course, everyone knows there was a, a war between Greece and Turkey, 1919 to 22, in which the Greek army was defeated. The result of that was, again, mass exodus um, at the time from the region, coastal region of Ionia to Greece itself. It was exacerbated by the destruction of the city of Smyrna or Izmir. Um, and although we do not know the accurate figures, it is clear that in 1928, census figures in Greece counted 1.2 million people at a time when there had been a very high mortality rate after settlement. So that's clearly much lower than the people who came in. There's also a new sort of um, awareness of the undocumented arrivals of people in other countries who went from Asia Minor, didn't stop off in Greece, were not documented and landed up in the diaspora. And this is being shown by a CSOX Greek diaspora project at St. Anthony's. And this is an ongoing sort of um, interest now of the, the worldwide global impact of the exchange. So now we come to the second section, which is the legal framework. I'm sure that my colleagues who are legal experts, and I'm not one, will make the same point, that it is important to distinguish between the treaty and the convention. The treaty of Peace was signed on the 24th of July, 1923, several months after the convention. And the aims of the treaty were to specifically to establish peace in the Near East. And secondly, to redraw boundaries of new nation states with great power guarantors. There was a political battle going on between the arising great powers of that time. The convention, as I noted, and I hope we all noticed this, that I was signed today, 30th of January, 1923. The second, second section of my presentation is um, the legal framework. So I've just highlighted some of the characteristics of the Lausanne Treaty, signed on the 24th of July, 1923. It was an unprecedented international agreement for a compulsory population exchange, compulsory underlined as being entirely unique. It was ratified by nine independent nation states. And the important thing is that it only put the seal on a huge scale of population displacement which preceded it. Now I'll turn to um, the convention itself. And I think I'd like to spend a bit of time just going through this point by point. <clears throat> the convention was a bilateral agreement between two states, not involving other nations, at least not officially, of course, the other nations represented there were jockeying for position as advisors. Secondly, it specified the reciprocal expulsion of the minority religions between Greece and Turkey. And the important thing which is often quite difficult for people nowadays to realize is that the criterion was religion and not language. That in itself created problems, um, as we know if you study these countries. It took place in two phases. Firstly, there was the initial fight, flight, which was the exodus after the hostilities and during them. There was a second phase, which was the forced uprooting of settled non-combatant populations. And that occurred in the areas which had been outside of the conflict zones, but in terms of the convention and its agreement, those people were forcibly 
removed from their places of origin, their homelands, and sent to the opposite country. And because of that, I want to make this point very strongly, which I often find uh, is, is um, a misunderstanding in the literature. It is not repatriation, but expulsion to a foreign country. And another important point, which had certain uh, contradictory aspects regarding identity, is that the convention granted immediate full citizenship in the host country. However, just to gloss on that, people in Greece continue to call themselves ref refugees even 50 years later. Uh, and this itself is a contradiction with the fact that they were full citizens in the host country that they had landed in. Right, so this is the section called consequences. In my examination of, I've done something wrong here, <clears throat> of the uh, overall view, in, in which I must acknowledge the contributors to the volume I edited called Crossing the Aegean um, were extraordinarily valuable in pointing out various aspects of the exchange. And because of the anthropological point of view, which is always holistic and multidisciplinary, we were looking at various aspects. And what came out of this most strikingly was the asymmetry of the um, impacts in both countries. I've put in a slide there of exchanged Muslims transported mm -hmm. to Turkey in 1924. Um, and these are people from the northern part of Greece who were literally uprooted with short notice and had to leave and to go to another country. Okay, so the consequences, um, which I identified, um, fall into five different sections. Demographic was one of the most important in the sense of the impact, immediate impact. So we have a decrease of Muslim, non-Muslim population in Turkey from 20 to 2.5%. I'm sure you can all read that actually, I won't go through it with you, but the important thing to note is that the influx increased the country, Greece's total population by one quarter. In Turkey, the exodus reduced its population from 15 million to 13.6 million. Okay, look at the political situation or economic, let's go to economic first. The important thing, which I'm very um, aware of the fact that there was this huge asymmetry in the experience because of the disruption that um, occurred in in the Turkish scene because of the lock of, loss of Greek and Armenian entrepreneurs who had trade networks and uh, part of the financial structure, which was the basis of the Ottoman economy at the time. Greece, however, ingrained, gained many entrepreneurs' skills, an enlarged labor force, increased market. To sum it up though, for the Greek point of view, there were short-term gains but the huge costs of settlement and the, and the dependency on international loans, which led to the country's bankruptcy, created a longer term problem. And this was reflected in what was going on at the political level. Greece's political stability was compromised by dependence on foreign creditors. And the asymmetry is shown up by the fact that external foreign interference, which had plagued the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century ended for Turkey. Okay, we can look at some aspects of the cultural impacts through literature, music, and art. Interesting again, in literature in Greece, there was a flourishing genre of nostalgia for lost homelands. However, in Turkey, decades of silence until the 1990s 
And then a new interest in the expelled population started to be expressed. There's a key chapter in the Crossing the Aegean book by Heraclis or Irakli Milas on the uh, effects on literature. In music, there is also an interesting contradiction in a sense that there's a rather simplified view of the um, impact of music. People will tend to say that, oh, the, the bazooki and the rebetiko was imported into, into Greece at that time by the um, Mikrasiatis, by the Anatolian performers. But uh, one of the contributors, Stathis Gauntlet, chose that there were various changes in popular music and that, in fact, the um, misinterpretation of the Rebetica as um, a, an import associated with an Anatolian displaced people, um, it in fact had been present and active in Greece for 50 years. It did flourish after the 1923, after the influx of Anatolian performers. So the, the um, particular issue that comes up in the chapter on music is that there was this um, tendency towards Orientalism expressed in a music genre, and it was counteracted by Westernizing tendencies that were also prevalent in Greece in the 1930s and later, um, and were also backed up by censorship of so-called Oriental music under the fascist regime of Metaxas. A very, very interesting paper. And I just one, one little comment on the art situation. In Greece, there was a revival of Byzantine church decoration with the influx of Anatolian artists. And one of the well-known figures is um, Kondoglu, who was a painter in his own right, but also an icon painter, and restored the genre, which had become, again, very much affected by the Renaissance Italian type of iconography. And it reverted to the closer prototypes of the Byzantine period. Social problems were another one which, um, interestingly enough, has both symmetrical and a kind of common basis to it. So in Turkey, the exchange resulted or was accompanied by identity differentiation, which was suppressed. And the idea of the, the phrase was Turkey for the Turks. So homogenization was the key feature in Greece, in Turkey for that period. Um, and the, in the, in the uh, Crossing the Aegean book, uh, Ayhan Akhtar has made a very important, um, well, it's, this is rather, it, it's something he's written rather more recently, is his own uh, reaction to noticing younger generation of Turks recognizing their diverse family origins. And that's something which people who are conscious of what's happening in Turkey at the moment will be able to verify better than I can. In Greece, it was important to note that the differentiation of identity became marked immediately following the exchange. There was a distinction between metropolitan Greeks and the incomers who were Mikrasiatis and defined their identity in opposite, opposition to, who, to Elinus. And I was struck by this as a, a young researcher at the time and had to try and unravel what the connotations were of alienness to a Mikrasiati. And so there was all these um, very fine distinctions. In Greece, too, there was another uh, dimension to the problems of integration and identity. Many of the incomers were Turkophones, Turkophoni, and they were stigmatized and even excluded from places because of this. The term which was used for them, which was very uncomplimentary together with others, but I just mentioned that they were called baptized in yogurt, Vyautu Vaptismeni. Uh, I think it's one other feature was that um, there were marked discrepancies in refugee settlements with regard to housing and to economic competition, so that poverty became a marked feature of those settlements for many, many decades. Okay, finally, the conclusions, and I've got those divided into two specific ones which relate to the Greek text ex exchange. 
as I noticed already, had a marked asymmetry in the two countries. I believe it can only be assessed adequately by a holistic, multidisciplinary approach which characterizes anthropology. For both sides, and here's a quote from my um, something I've published somewhere, this event in which Yanni already pointed out quite clearly, it was a watershed in political, demographic, and sociocultural terms. And there was a summary phrase which was made by somebody uh, who worked in economics and politics and didn't have an overall view, but mentioned that Greece has gained economically and lost politically, while Turkey has gained politically but lost economically. So finally, you can look at the general features, which we, which I'd like to make a, a, an argument to the fact that there is a universal dimension to forced displacement. It's a common experience of losing a homeland. And in the Turkish case, it was on both sides. But in fact, it's the universal experience of those forcibly displaced anywhere. Attachments to place of origin adieus, endures through successive generations. Population expulsions entail high human costs with long-term ramifications. I have noticed and observed that at the political level, these human costs don't feature in the equation, and it, there seems to be a preference always for short-term political stability. And it is clear from our experience that the short term is one uh, that can fluctuate quite wildly. In all of the cases where there are forcible displacements, I need only mention um, Israel, Palestine, Cyprus, uh, the Indian subcontinent, etc. So there's a lot of important, there's an important kind of message about our focus on the Lausanne Convention and its ramifications at a global level. And so my final conclusion is that political segregation as a short-term measure does not solve the sources of conflict. And um, I want to thank my very efficient <laughs> research person. Okay. Thank you very, very much for this very informative and insightful presentation. I think you covered wonderfully both the political and the historical cultural side. I'll now give the floor to our three panelists. I'll start with Professor Evans Kazivasiliu, who will have about seven minutes, so to give ourselves some time, to discuss uh, how the anniversary has been discussed, perceived in Greece, what are the lessons of the past and what it means today in Greek society. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Yanni. It's a great honor to participate uh, in this event. Well, um, I will try to discuss the exchange, the compulsory exchange of populations from the point of view of politics and law. Now, that convention, the Greek Turkish Convention of 30th January 1923, was the first, and to my knowledge, effectively has remained the only international agreement, international agreement providing for the compulsory movement of people, indeed of whole communities. Until then, the rule was the voluntary exchange of people who opted to move. And there have been such precedents even in the Balkans uh, in those years. The compulsory nature of the Greek-Turkish exchange is the reason why the 1923 convention was one of the most painful international agreements in history. It did not give to the people concerned the right to choose. And for this reason, it has been argued even then that it was an immoral ag agreement and therefore legally invalid, although we all understand that this would have little practical effect. I mean, it was a fait accompli. Uh, the convention, in my view, marked the full prevalence of the views of the Turkish Kemalist movement. It was imposed by Victorius Ankara to vanquish Athens. The Turks had already noted that the Christian populations of the Ottoman Empire had been used as a lever 
uh, by the neighboring states to claim Ottoman territories. And there have been huge uh, waves of refugees in the Ottoman Empire from the Balkans in previous cases, even after the Balkan Wars. So after 1913, the Young Turks decided to protect what they saw as the geopolitical heart of their state, Asia Minor, and turned against their Christian populations, Armenian, Greek, and Assyrian. So the year 1922 marked the triumph of these Turkish nationalist views about the future of the region. Why then did Greece accept this uh, um, agreement and Greece's representative at Lausanne, Eleftherios Venizelos? Well, this took place for very practical reasons. In effect, by the time the convention was being discussed, late 1922, the flight of the Greek populations of Western Asia Minor and of Eastern Thrace had already been concluded. The great majority of the Greeks had already been expelled from Turkish controlled territories and what remained were few uh, small communities, for example, the Pontic Greeks or the uh, Turkish-speaking Greek Orthodox of Cappadocia. Therefore, for Venizelos, there was no way to avoid the expulsion of the Greeks, which had already taken place. And through the agreements, Venizelos tried to secure the movement of the Muslim population of Greece to provide for some space in order to settle the vast number of people who had already fled from Ionia and Thrace. Venizelos did not embrace the logic of the ethnically cleansed states. He had worked in the Treaty of Sevres for a greater Greece that would be a multi-ethnic state, but he felt that he had no choice but to accept the 1923 convention. Now, there's another interesting issue to discuss, namely what the convention tells us about identities in the Balkans in this era of transition from imperial governance to the nation state. Exactly because the Greek-Turkish exchange was compulsory, the two states had to find the one and only criterion which would define objectively the ethnicity of people and therefore decide whether a person would be exchanged or, or not. There could, be, there could not be more than one criteria. Multiplicity could lead to contradictory results. So if both religion and language had been accepted as criteria, in the case of the Turkish-speaking Christians or Greek-speaking Muslims, there would be a dead end. This was, in fact, the only time in modern history until today when two Balkan states had to define a dominant element of ethnicity. And the cr criterion that they chose to define who was Greek or Turk was religion and not language. The convention did not provide for the exchange of Greek and Turkish speakers. It provided for the exchange of uh, followers of two different religions. Now, I'm going to sound somehow harsh, but this was not for that time an illogical provision. It was rather accurate and corresponded to the social realities prevalent in the Ottoman Empire. For example, the Turkish Cretans were not were Greek speaking. They did, did not even speak Turkish. However, in successive Cretan uprisings during the 19th century, the Turkish Cretans had fought hard in favor of the Ottoman Empire. They had proven in the battlefield that they were Turkish. Uh, despite the fact that they spoke Greek. And similarly, there were Turkish-speaking Christians, for example, in the Pontus area, who had fought equally far, uh, hard against the Ottomans. The compulsory exchange was a bad thing, surely. But once it had been agreed, the criterion for the exchange corresponded to the realities on the ground. I'm not arguing that this criterion settled all cases satisfactorily. There was nothing satisfactory in this uh, uh, affair. But I'm arguing that it left the least number of cases unsettled in, in an overall context of great human misery. Uh, on the other hand, the convention remained the only such agreement that provided for a compulsory exchange. There were, of course, cases in international history when populations were forcibly, forcibly ex expelled from their homes. Many such cases, even until recently in the Balkans. But at least one could view it as a consolation that the Greek Turkish legal precedent of 1923 was not repeated internationally. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hadzi Vasiliou. That was very interesting. I'll now give the floor to Professor Wood Osu, who has done extensive work on population exchange from the legal and political dimension. And I hope he can also give us a perspective from the Turkish point of view, that is how the population exchange 
was dealt with in Turkey of 1923 and whether there's any discussion about it today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Grigoriadis. Uh, I apologize for, for mingling your, your name. Uh, uh, I've, I've, I've long been a fan of the work of um, you know, everyone involved uh, in, this, in this webinar, so I'm, so I'm very, very uh, you know, thankful and honored to be, uh, to be involved in it. Uh, Professor Hirshon's uh, edited volume was one of the first things that I read on the uh, compulsory exchange when I was working on this as a graduate student many years ago. Um, uh, so the first thing that, that uh, I'd just like to sort of say is that I approach this topic um, as an international law scholar, first and foremost. So I am not an Ottomanist. I am not a historian of Turkey as such. I'm a historian and theorist of international law, public international law in particular. Um, and uh, I worked on this topic as a doctoral student uh, from about 2000. 7 to 2011, and then the, the resulting uh, dissertation was published um, in 2015 by Oxford. Um, so what I try to bring to these discussions is um, a sociologically, historically, and political economically informed analysis of the exchange process from the standpoint of international law. Um, so what I'm going to try to do in my, in my comments here, and I'll try to be brief, um, uh, because I, I'm, I'm very interested in, in hearing everyone else, um, is, is situate the population exchange process from an international law uh, perspective or, or against the background of international law, contemporaneous international law, first and foremost, but the history of international law more broadly speaking, uh, more generally. So the first thing that I would note is that this is, as Professor Hirshon um, and, and, and everyone else um, you know, is, is uh, rightfully pointing out, an international treaty. Uh, we've got a convention here in, in, in January uh, 1923. Um, a convention is, uh, the term convention is interchangeable with the term treaty uh, for international lawyers. Uh, so this is an international treaty. Um, so, um, you know, that is a canonical positivist instrument of international law making that two or more states can, can, can um, you know, be engaged in. Uh, so the first thing that I would note is, uh, and I'm reading from my book here, um, is that uh, this is an international treaty. What's more, it's an instrument that regulated um, or purported to regulate the exchange procedure that was negotiated and drafted uh, in the form, the specific form of a treaty, as that was understood at the time. Uh, that treaty was deposited with the relevant authorities. It was registered with the League of Nations. Uh, the foremost international organization at the time, of course, the precursor of today's United Nations. It was published in the League of Nations official compendium of treaties. Um, so these hundreds of volumes of the League of Nations treaty series that, that we can you know, access in any of our libraries, um, you know, it appears there along with all of the other instruments that together comprise the Lausanne Peace Settlement. Uh, so the Lausanne Peace Treaty itself, but you know, the, the more than a dozen instruments uh, that together comprise that settlement, all of them uh, were published as part of that treaty series. Um, the treaty entered into force with the requisite ratifications, and most tellingly of all, it was accepted and understood by the concerned parties, by third states, and by the Permanent Court of International Justice, which is the precursor to today's International Court of Justice, the so-called World Court, the highest court of international law, and ostensibly at least the highest court in the world, uh, it was understood by the World Court as a specifically legal document that generated specifically legal obligations, obligations under international law, uh, as well as obligations under domestic law, the domestic law in Greece, as well as the domestic law in Turkey. Um, so that is the first thing to note. Um, and the conclusion uh, that, that comes from that is that to dismiss the international uh, treaty, the Convention on the Population Exchange, as illegal or perhaps extra legal, under these sorts of circumstances would, uh, I submit, uh, be to falling prey to a naive and historic and a historical idealism. Um, it would be in effect to elide the fact that international law and its various precursors, so Jus Gentium, uh, Droit de Gênes, uh, the public law of Europe, it's been called many things uh, in many different places uh, before and after Jeremy Bentham coined the term international law in the last decade of the 18th century. Um, you know, to dismiss the convention as illegal or extra legal would be to elide the fact that international law and uh, its, its precursors have always been intrinsic to the exercise of state power. 
not least in the context of interstate conflict, not least in the context of mass deportations, mass expulsions. Uh, so that would be the first thing to note. Um, and I note that not in any way to justify or to excuse or to defend the population um, exchange procedure, not in the least, um, but to understand that international law itself you know, has its own quote unquote dark sides, right? Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, I'm an educator and oftentimes, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, students, particularly undergraduate students who approach international law for the first time are of the view that international law is a humanitarian and compassionate enterprise and that, you know, we need more international law, not less of it. And that if we have more international human rights law or better enforcement of international law, then we'll have a better world and so on and so forth. Well, not so fast. International law has been integral to and absolutely vital to the histories of colonialism and imperialism and neocolonialism and so on. Um, and here we have an instance, uh, a very tragic instance of, of, of a compulsory procedure that uproots uh, hundreds of thousands of people that is justified, legitimated, formalized in and through international law and in and through international organizations like the League. So that's the first point. The second point is the question of the legality of the treaty itself. The question of the legal credentials or qualifications, as it were, of the treaty itself from the standpoint of contemporaneous international law. So what did international lawyers at the time in the 1920s and 30s make of the uh, convention, make of the procedure itself uh, or the exchange process itself? Did they have anything to say about it? How to, has that played into the development, the progressive development of international law or not so progressive development of international law subsequently? Uh, so here again, I'm reading from my, my book, but um, um, what I said there was um, the legal status of population transfer, both of the explicitly compulsory and of the nominally voluntary kind and the uh, uh, distinction between the two, while clear conceptually perhaps to some, is in fact, in historical practice, very, very slippery, of course. We know that so-called voluntary uh, population transfers, what are now called voluntary population transfers, are shot through with all manner of coercion and persecution, so as to effectively be compulsory, even if they're not formally, formally characterized as such. Uh, the legal status of population transfer, both compulsory and voluntary, was anything but settled at the time of the exchange. The Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907 had made no mention of forcible displacement as such. In fact, with the exception of Article 23 of the 1863 Lieber Code, which was formulated for the US um, Civil War uh, by Francis Lieber, a German-American international lawyer, um, that code, which contained a vague prohibition on, quote, the carrying off to distant parts of private citizens, it would not be until after the Second World War that international legal instruments containing express or implied prohibitions of population transfer, such as the Genocide Convention, which contains a subprovision on the forcible transfer of uh, children from one group to another, and the Fourth Geneva Convention, uh, which effectively prohibits uh, mandatory or compulsory population transfer. Uh, it would not be until then that we would begin to have these sorts of express or implied prohibitions of population transfer. Uh, still, most interwar jurists were skeptical of its legality. So Robert Redslob, uh, a very uh, well-known jurist at the time, uh, branded transfer a political, not a legal solution to the so-called problem of nationalities, useful perhaps as a means of fostering national unity, but running counter the, to the kind of minority protection found, quote, in every peace treaty by virtue of customary law. Other jurists noted that the population transfer mechanism departed from established European techniques like the so-called right of option, the right, that is, of people inhabiting territories transferred from one sovereign to another to choose between retaining their existing nationalities, in which case they would be expected to move, and becoming nationals of the new sovereign, in which case they would remain where they were. Uh, the, quote, brutal measure of expulsion and forced emigration, end quote, flo flouted such techniques, they argued, falling foul of the basic principles, quote, that are the foundation of the public law of civilized nations. And of course, this rhetoric of civilization is ubiquitous at the time. It doesn't fall out uh, or get dropped out of international legal discourse until really in the 1950s. Uh, a product mainly of Turkey's desire to liquidate its minorities, quote, completely and radically, end quote, the exchange was, quote, an unfortunate regression in the evolution of the law of nations, holding back its diplomatic, doctrinal, and jurisprudential development. 
Some jurists, though, differed in their assessment and were willing to consider even overtly compulsory exchanges as minimally legal, though not necessarily deserving of moral or political praise. While Lausanne did not comply with prevailing principles of minority protection, one jurist admitted, it did offer, quote, an entirely different approach, end quote, to resolving conflict through law. So the 1922-34 Greek-Turkish exchange, I used 34 as the sort of bookend there, just because the mixed commission wounds up its, winds up its work around then. Uh, the Greek-Turkish exchange may have threatened to restore, quote, the wild and primitive conception of war, wrote another jurist, but it had also been enshrined in, quote, a solemnly signed and legally ratified treaty. And I underscore that point. Um, indeed, no less an authority than the Permanent Court of International Justice, right? the highest court in the world, stated in uh, uh, um, uh, cases involving directly the Convention on the Population Exchange, stated that the Greek-Turkish exchange was governed by bi binding international treaty and that the interpretational dispute with which it was confronted in those cases, quote, involved a proper question of international law. In what is that? The question of the treaty's legality or even legitimacy was simply not on the table for the permanent court. Um, and we can go on. We can say such views are often exerted, uh, often exerted considerable influence over policymakers. British authorities in Mandate era Palestine were so impressed by the Greek Turkish endeavor that they too would entertain an exchange, so as is well known. Um, the Peel Commission, you know, famously wrote in its report in 1938, uh, whereas formerly, quote, the Greek and Turkish minorities had been a constant irritant. Uh, um, I'm continuing with the quote, the ulcer had now been clean cut out. And that, in the Peel Commission's view, placed relations between the two states on much firmer footing, Greece and Turkey, that is. And so that was a model to be used for Palestine. Um, of course, we all know what happened with the Nakba and everything else. Um, so that's the second point that, that I would like to sort of just underscore here, that not only is this an international treaty, which tells you more about the dark sides of international law than it does about the exchange process, perhaps, but nevertheless, it's an important point, uh, mm -hmm. but that there was considerable uh, <laughs> agreement around the, the, the uh, minimal legality, or at any rate, the uh, minimal legality of the treaty, or at any rate, the idea that, that it didn't run afoul, it didn't contradict uh, existing international law, whether international treaty law or what we now call customary international law, uh, directly or explicitly. Uh, the third and final point that I would make, perhaps, if I have time, um, uh, Professor, yes, um, is in regard to the question of, of how precisely the law relates to the facts, to the historical process itself. So how precisely does the exchange treaty or the exchange convention intervene in or formalize or constitute or reshape, right? Depending on your interpretation, the exchange process itself, right? So this is the question of whether the exchange treaty is essentially a fait accompli, uh, an after the fact rubber stamp of something that is already unfolding because of the destruction, the partial destruction of Izmir, Smyrna, and the expulsion of, of, of uh, ethnic Greeks, ethno-linguistically uh, defined Greeks uh, from the Asia Minor coast, the Ionian coast, and, and to some degree from Eastern Thrace as well. So on this, um, this is what I had to say, uh, you know, in 2015. Um, uh, as the first legally structured compulsory endeavor of its scale and sophistication, and I have a chapter specifically on the 1913-1914 uh, um, uh, attempts to work up population transfers uh, between Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire, between Greece and Turkey, and then 1919, where we have the Greek-Bulgarian uh, uh, mechanism for population transfer as well. But this is, of course, mandatory, and it's on a massive scale, uh, the Greek-Turkish exchange. As the first legally structured compulsory endeavor, compulsory endeavor of its scale and sophistication, the sheer ambition of the exchange was staggering. Over 1 million Greeks, or those identified as such, were uprooted from Asia Minor and Eastern Thrace immediately before and during the formal exchange, which began in 1923 and continued for years to come. Uh, and that's the formal exchange, right? 1922, of course, we've got the expulsions. And something in the vicinity of 350,000 Muslims, or those so classified, were expelled from Greece's mainland and islands over the same stretch of time. The formal exchange concluded at Lausanne in January 1923 followed the expulsion of large numbers of Greeks and others from Asia Minor and Eastern Thrace in 1922, particularly after the partial destruction of Izmir, and has therefore sometimes been presented as an endorsement of an already existing reality. 
This, in my view, ignores the fact that the formal exchange called for a variety of fresh movements, nearly all 350,000 Muslims and roughly 200,000 of the concerned Greeks. It also, crucially, misses the point that the formal procedure lent legal legitimacy to a set of movements that redistributed land and capital across enormous swaths of territory, establishing a comprehensive legal regime to manage relief, resettlement, and indemnification efforts. More than two months of tough negotiations were needed before Turkey and the Allied powers were able to agree on the terms of the exchange, and all parties invested heavily in the talks. This was an exercise both in producing new facts on the ground and in druidifying the dispossession, displacement, and capital accumulation that had already taken place. Um, so that is the sort of rub, uh, uh, the nub rather, of my of my comments here. I, I, uh, I don't have much time left, I, I think. Um, I could sort of stretch things into the sort of, you know, history of the present of population transfer. Population transfer as a term uh, is something, as I noted, that gets dropped out of, of canonical international law or mainstream international law after the Second World War in the sense that you do in, end up getting uh, implied or express prohibitions of population transfer, particularly, of course, in the compulsory or mandatory mode. Um, but, um, you know, population transfers continue all the way through, right? So we can think about you know, Idi Amin and the expulsion of South Asians from Uganda. We can think about Cyprus in 74, the expulsions North and South. Uh, we can think about ongoing developments in Syria, uh, the forced displacements in Syria uh, that have completely uh, 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 altered the demographic realities on the ground in that country, Arab, Turkmen, Kurdish, you know, various other groups and so on course, confessional groups as well, Christians of various kinds and so on as well. Um, so there are many, many examples that we can give. And there are, there are examples like, for example, Hungary and Czechoslovakia after the Second World War that Matthew Frank and others have, have done notable work on as well. Uh, but if you stretch it right to the present, you can think about the readmission agreements that have been concluded between Turkey and the EU in recent years for the, the uh, uh, regimentation and, 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 and corralling of, of of, of refugees and displaced persons from Syria and elsewhere, um, how that controls mobility. Uh, if we can conclude, Professor, so because yes. we need to keep our time. Absolutely. And the other example I would give is climate change refugees, where there are attempts to work up what are in effect mandatory population transfer schemes in order to ensure that you know citizens of, of tiny island states that are literally being submerged as a result of climate change are able to live elsewhere. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for this very interesting presentation. And I'll give the floor to Professor Rarian Gingeras, who's joining us from uh, the United States. Thank you very much for coming come so early. Uh, Ryan is from California, so he is, it's a great thing to be uh, with us so early in the morning. He teaches at the Naval Force Graduate College. He's a professor there, and he has written several very interesting books on the late Ottoman history and the transition from the Ottoman Empire to the Republic. So he's a very qualified person to talk about how the population exchange has featured in Ottoman Turkish history, as well as international history of the time. Please unmute. Sorry about that. Um, first of all, thank you very much for, for inviting me, for thinking of me. Thank you for all the panelists um, for your wonderful talks. Uh, I know we're almost to the hour here, so I'm going to try to be as brief as possible. Um, you know, I was uh, charged today to talk a little bit about the international implications uh, of the treaty. Uh, and I, I have to say that I think virtually all the panelists have talked about this to some extent or, um, or another. And so I, in some respects, I, uh, I can keep this part very brief. Um, as we've already heard um, over the last uh, 45 minutes, uh, the development of the treaty in terms of uh, its legal precedents, its historical precedents, um, uh, is a subject of, of considerable interest. It's, it's clear that immediate historical precedents came into play in the development of the treaty, and specifically thinking about um, the case of the Ottoman Empire. Um, it was in 1913 that the Ottoman Empire established a population exchange, a, a, a not just a transfer of one population uh, from one state to another, but mutual exchange between Bulgaria um, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, in terms of their popu shared populations on the border. 
uh, in again uh, at the very close of the Second Balkan War. Um, most certainly, um, other precedents uh, stood to to bear in terms of the the mass flight or mass uh, mass transfer of populations from the Balkans to rump uh, portions of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then sort of looking past 1922, it's clear that the Treaty of Luzon, specifically this convention, um, served as either a point of inspiration or um, in fact, uh, served as, a, uh, as a, an actual model for the development of uh, the transfer of population or the actual exchange of population. Um, the Peel Commission was mentioned already with respect to Palestine. Um, we have a number of post-1945 precedents, um, it, whether it's the mass transfer of Germans or the exchange of populations uh, along various um, East, uh, Central European states. For example, at the Treaty of Potsdam um, during the course of negotiations in 19, post-1945, uh, the Treaty of Lausanne was specifically mentioned as a main precedent when it came to the transference of, of population. So, all said and done, uh, there is, you know, uh, a fair amount of work out there, and there's already been a fair amount of discussion in terms of its um, its impact internationally. Um, I want to sort of, again, with the few minutes I have, just cite the knock-on effects when it comes to the transfer of population. You know, most of the time when we talk about the treaty uh, and the exchanges, we talk about the development of national identity, its impact on national identity in Greece and in, and in Turkey, but specifically with Greeks and Turks. And, you know, I think one less often discussed aspect of this is the effect, for example, the treaty would have on Kurds. So, for example, you know, one of the uh, principles of the exchange was that uh, through the transference of, of population, not only from Greece, but also later um, the transference of Muslims from other Balkan states, be it Yugoslavia or Bulgaria or Romania, um, uh, that these populations would be used uh, to offset um, the uh, Kurdish uh, con concentrations of Kurds in various portions of Anatolia. Um, you know, on the flip side of this, you know, the transfer of Orthodox Christians to Greece had a direct impact on uh, populations, especially within northern Greece, where you're talking about Macedonians and uh, portions of Aegean Macedonia, or Albanian speakers, at, for example, in the Chamoria. And if we we're going to think about the subject of Luzon Treaty as having an international impact, most certainly it shaped the dimensions around which um, Kurdish identity would develop around Macedonian identity would eventually develop, uh, as well as you know the development of something like Albania, not just simply Albania as, as a nation, but also something like its its parameters as um, a as a body encompassing territory. So you know when we think about the you know the development of the treaty in this respect, you know, the the treaty in and of itself you know, forced various populations to think about um, their immediate surroundings in a new reality. Uh, so I think, you know, since we're almost out of time, and I know we're at the top of the hour, I'm going to stop there and uh, uh, get ready for Q&A. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much, Ryan, for this very succinct and interesting presentation. I think very interesting uh, points have emerged from all presentations. And uh, something that is important today, even in Turkish politics and overall in politics, I think, overall around the world, is this discussion about whether the state comes first or the citizen comes first. What is the, what is the interest to protect? And I think that the population exchange agreement made a decisive uh, intervention on the side of the state. State interest prevails, nation building. Uh, consolidation uh, is uh, what uh, is the most important aim. And uh, in my opinion, and I think this is reflected very well into the discussion, we uh, the presentations we had, is that this was understood uh, as a success in the very first year. So this, this became a source of inspiration. And uh, what I find very remarkable is that the two countries very quickly decided to bypass the very thorny issue of economic compensation because population exchange was one thing, but compensation about properties behind 
was another very, very big issue that both countries decided to ditch eventually a few years later because they decided to look forward into a new era of Greek-Turkish relation. And it's quite amazing, in my opinion, the fact that just less than a decade after this treaty, there was a friendship agreement between Greece and Turkey and a sort of a very interesting transformation of their relationship. Of course, it is important to consider the international uh, political circumstances at that time. And uh, as you said, uh, like uh, uh, many of you pointed the fact that uh, Palestine or other conflict zones around the world try to look into this population exchange agreement as a source of inspiration. However, as the international law developed and we have treaties banning genocides, kind of human rights and the individual comes to the forefront, all these discussions today appears to be very cynical and like awful in our minds. And of course, what is very important is to look into the loss, the cultural, human, individual loss of people who have never traveled in their lives and then suddenly they were forced to resettle thousands or hundreds of kilometers away from where they live all their life, right? And as we said, the criteria set uh, appear to be uh, fitting the circumstances. Maybe it was the best possible criterion. But on the other hand, it still made the life of all these people very miserable, like uh, moving to a country where you don't speak the language or having to face uh, discrimination or difficulties, not very different from the discrimination difficulties that contemporary refugees are facing around the world. So it is very important, in my opinion, to raise these issues and also remember that uh, uh, what appeared to be a success story on the state level was paid with a very, very big human and cultural price. And uh, this uh, transformation became maybe more profound in Greece, where the school discussion was very strong for many years, maybe because of the demographic uh, sort of uh, dimension as well, which was raised by René, that the fact that the uh, population of Greece was raised by 25% in a few weeks. So it was very difficult to silence this issue. In Turkey, the situation was very different because Turkey's, uh, the effect of population exchange was more limited. Turkey was a refugee country as well, but from different historical events, not particularly from this. But in recent years, and with uh, the opening of Turkish civil society discussions around 20 years ago, there was a new space for these issues to be discussed in culture and art. So, because we're running out of time, I will have to conclude our first panel and thank very much our speakers for their very interesting presentations. We will have an opportunity for the audience to ask questions in the second panel that is coming soon, where there will be an emphasis on uh, culture and history and memory. We will look into how population exchange has been reflected on, uh, the, on the history and the culture of Greece and Turkey. So any questions? Any of the panelists may want to stay online uh, so that they can answer the questions later, but uh, there will be a new moderator that is going to be Nick Danforth, who will see, be taking over soon with a new set of uh, very uh, interesting and very uh, knowledgeable panelists. So thank you very much for being with us. There will be a short break now, and then uh, Nick will take over. Thank you so much.
Welcome back. Thank you all for sticking around for part two of our panel. Uh, we have uh, several fantastic new panelists that I'm going to introduce in a moment. Uh, very much hope to continue the conversation that we've been having over the past hour. Uh, before I read the introductions, I just want to restate what uh, questions for any on anything that we've heard on anything that you hear over the next half hour as our new panelists uh, give their presentations. I would encourage you to email to events at lemf.gr. Again, that's events at lemf.gr. Email in your questions, they'll be passed along to me. And in the second part of this panel, we'll have a chance to discuss all of them. Uh, with that, let me introduce the new panelists. First up, we have Professor Ayhan Akhtar, uh, Professor of Sociology at Istanbul Bilgi University. Uh, he has written, in addition to uh, writing about the population exchange, on a remarkable variety of topics. I think other people who are subscribed to academia.edu have probably also had the experience I have uh, of being constantly distracted by his work. It seems like academia emails something new of his every week. Uh, and invariably, it looks much more interesting than whatever I'm supposed to be working on that day. Uh, so pleasure to have him on the panel. After that, we have Calliope Amigdalo, a senior research fellow at LEMF, uh, also the principal investigator for the Home Across Project, which I would encourage everyone to check out. Uh, you can find out much more about it, see some of their work on the LEMF website. Uh, and finally, we have Bruce Clark, uh, author and journalist at The Economist. Uh, many people will be familiar with his book, Twice a Stranger, uh, which was certainly my, and I suspect other people's, uh, first introduction to this topic. Uh, oh, and I, of course, am Nicholas Danforth, uh, non-resident senior research fellow at the Turkey Program uh, and editor at War on the Rocks magazine. So with that, uh, let me turn the discussion over to Professor Akhtar. Uh, all our panelists will speak for seven or eight minutes. And then again, please do email any questions you have to events at lamf.gr. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, thank you, everybody, for inviting me to this uh, beautiful event, which is the uh, 100th anniversary of this terrible uh, uh, international convention, which really uh, shook the lives of more than one and a half million people on both sides of the Aegean and changed the political uh, trajectories of both countries. Uh, up to now, uh, international law specialists did not mention, I better start with that first. <laughs> Population exchange was a, a ethnic cleansing done in a very polite manner <clears throat> in a small town in Switzerland. Uh, where the diplomats and representatives of uh, great powers and Turkey and Greece and United States, uh, you know, uh, stayed around uh, a huge nice table and they discussed the future of uh, uh, Anatolian Greeks and Romanian Muslims. Uh, as Rene uh, has mentioned in her introduction, uh, uh, quoting from an American uh, diplomat, Raymond Haar, who, who produced a beautiful report in 1930, uh, Turkey lost economically, Greece gained uh, uh, economically, and uh, this contradiction is understandable. Uh, why it is so? Because uh, Turkey lost uh, uh, a very important group in the population, which used to be the 20% of Turkey's population. I mean, Greeks, Armenians, uh, all together before 1922 uh, or before the First World War. And uh, this loss uh, was strategically important because these were the people as the most skilled uh, representatives of the uh, Ottoman Turkish working class. They were entrepreneurs. They were the middlemen, especially in the, uh, on the Aegean coast. And they were the ones uh, 
you know, connecting the link between the Turkish Muslim producer in the inside of the uh, Aegean coast and the exporters in the big cities like Smyrna. These were mo mostly uh, Levantine people. And when all this chain was broken, the uh, economic uh, consequence of this exchange was drastic for Turkey. Uh, I mean, in the uh, second half of 1920s, people were complaining that they cannot find any artisan to take care of their roof, or they cannot find any artisan to work uh, a bricklayer, you know, in, an, in a construction. This was a major thing. And it was also important from the point of international capital. Uh, I remember I quoted from a uh, uh, dried fruit importer from uh, United Kingdom. Uh, he was complaining that nobody is presenting any, any uh, you know, sample uh, dried figs or dried other dried fruit to, to them to import for the chocolate industry, for example. Uh, this also created uh, different trajectories for the development of Turkish economy. I mean, uh, after 1923, uh, the newly established Republic worked hard to reach Ottoman export figures until 1927-28. Uh, and then the world economic crisis hit the country and they had nothing to do except to move to a, you know, command economy that we call it etatist economy. They started to establish state economic enterprises from 1930 onwards, and this created a kind of a, uh, you know, passive, colossal set of establishments, set of state companies, which really slowed down to a certain extent the economy and also created a lot of, a lot of uh, problems for the political elite of the country. But the most important thing is the nature of Turkish bourgeoisie has changed. Uh, I mean, the Turkish bourgeoisie, which developed in the early years of the Republic until 1970s, to be honest, uh, were the ones who tried to get uh, a contract from Ankara or try to sell something uh, with a the, with the, uh, commission not to deal with any, any kind of, uh, you know, ingenious work, any kind of a, uh, creative work to produce anything cheaper. Uh, the Turkish bourgeoisie uh, is, is a, a very strange animal that uh, it is uh, competing in the corridors of the ministries in Ankara uh, uh, in order to get more commission work, more commission uh, 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 contracts. <clears throat> uh, the other thing is important is uh, uh, the, the exchange has created uh, a kind of a asymmetric results, which Rene has mentioned, because most of the Greeks left the country uh, were urban people, and most of the Muslims coming to Turkey were rural. And uh, in the process of settlement, uh, uh, it was very difficult for the Turkish officials to settle them in an uh, economically profitable and productive locations. Uh, the last thing is this. Uh, you know, uh, again, Rene mentioned that the incoming uh, Anatolian Greeks to the north of uh, Greece, to Macedonia, were treated rather badly. Uh, the, the, the settled people over there, uh, Dopi, as the Greeks call it, uh, were treated them as second class citizens, put the names like the ones in baptized in yogurt or Turkos Poros, et cetera, et cetera. Similar things happened on the Western coast of Turkey too. Uh, there is a result of it. I mean, it's, it's a very uh, sad result. 
as a Turk, whenever I traveled on the north of Greece, I'm always treated very nicely. People speak to me in Turkish and, you know, offer tea, coffee uh, all the time, etc. Then, uh, when I hear the election results of uh, Greece, I see some of these small locations where I visited, where I was treated very nicely, are voting for Golden Dow. Why it is so? I mean, I, I really thought of it and uh, talking to my Greek friends, and I came to a conclusion. These people in last three generations were treated as, you know, as aliens in Greek society, and they tried to prove their Greekness by voting for Golden Down. They do not agree probably with the general, uh, you know, principles of Golden Down. They are not like Hitlerian type of fascists or Nazis, but they want to prove themselves. We have the similar result on the Aegean coast. I mean, most of the guys who, you know, settled there coming from Crete islands or from uh, Northern Macedonia, Macedonia, they were, they were discriminated as well. I mean, they were treated as uh, Rum Tohumu, Yunan Tohumu, which means uh, Greek seed and so on. And they tried to prove their Turkishness by voting for Nationalist Action Party in Turkish elections. It is very interesting to note that. Therefore, population exchange, yes, it was an ethnic cleansing done in a very polite manner by the diplomats, but its repercussions are still there and we are living uh, within it. I better stop here, uh, Nicholas. Uh, not to exceed my time, and I shall be happy to answer uh, any questions if they arise. Thank you. And thank you. Turning things over to Calliope. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Um, so I would like to make some comments regarding the spatial and, and architectural footprint of the population exchange and how that uh, constitutes or perhaps is beginning to constitute a heritage. Um, to do that, I need to briefly describe the refugee settlement process on the Greek, on the Greek side um, today, although much of what I will talk about applies to the Turkish side as well. Uh, we know that uh, at the most basic level, resettlement was divided into urban and rural, and indeed uh, in Greece, that, that this was pretty much successful around half of the uh, 1.2 million incoming refugees were channeled towards the countryside. Uh, as uh, Professor Akhtar mentioned earlier, this was considered to be beneficial um, both for the state and the refugees. The refugees would have an easier means of survival by engaging with agriculture while mobilizing and expanding the farming sector at the same time. Hundreds of new villages were constructed from zero, especially in northern Greece. Uh, while large infrastructural projects were combined with the resettlement process. We usually don't think about it, but things such as diversions of rivers and dams and the draining of swamps uh, happened in parallel with the refugee resettlement process. Um, and uh, meanwhile, hundreds of thousands settled in the urban centers. Whole cities expanded with new neighborhoods and suburbs, some, sometimes doubling in size. In 1928, 30, almost 30% of the population of Athens and 40% of Piraeus were refugees, while in cities like, as, like Drama in northern Greece, refugees constituted 70% of the population. Now, apart from the main division into urban and uh, rural, uh, one can categorize this huge spatial transformation because you can imagine the impact of this uh, exchange on the urban and rural landscape, uh, one can um, categorize this along four main types of settlements. And the first and uh, well known to all of us is the housing and exchange properties. So Greek refugees were housed uh, in the uh, homes of the outgoing Muslims and the other way around, of course. Now, through a clear bureaucratic financial and legal process, this 19th century Ottoman built stock was transformed into refugee housing. 
So we know from uh, the archives that, um, for example, houses were evaluated one by one, uh, qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, we have descriptions such as, you know, this is a house of medium condition, it has two rooms and a barn. Uh, it's evaluated at eight uh, English pounds, and this sum is charged on the refugee. So the refugee owes uh, to the state or to the um, refugee settlement committee this amount of money. Um, so in this sense, this built stock uh, of the exchange properties is a double heritage. It is, um, it is the heritage of the outgoing refugees, the Muslim refugees, but also of the incoming Greek uh, refugees. It's, it carries significant layers of meaning for different displaced groups and can be placed within a, a larger history of, of displacement. Um, second, we have uh, lots, a very, a, a, big, a very big amount of housing constructed by the state or the Refugee Relief Fund or the Refugee Settlement Committee. Less so in Turkey, more so on the Greek side. Um, over many decades, decades in different forms, ranging from wooden shacks to modernist mass housing units in the 30s. So in, this, in their simplest form, these uh, structures, as uh, René Hilsson has uh, shown very well in her landmark work uh, on Coquigna, uh, these structures were single rooms made uh, of mud brick or wood, uh, around 20 to 30 square meters, one for each family, which formed rectangular urban blocks with interior courtyards. Now, this first emergency architecture was not meant to be fixed or complete. It offered a minimal dwelling, a chance uh, for survival, and it was expected that the refugee would complete, improve, subdivide, or expand it. Later, in the late 20s, we, have, we see two, two floor stone structures uh, containing two, four, or even eight residential units. These were, these were better in quality and larger in size. This happened, started happening in the second half of the 20s and into the 30s. And then in the 1930s, we witnessed the construction of modern mass housing units, uh, such as the, ones in, the famous ones in Alexandras Avenue. We have so many all over Greece. Um, and important modern architects such as Kimon Laskaris, Dimitri Kiriakos, Agelos Siagas were involved in the design of uh, some of these mass housing units. Now, it's important to, to note perhaps that uh, the design of all these uh, different typologies that I've been talking about uh, was not a local affair. The authors of even the single, uh, single floor structures were aware of similar examples in Europe and elsewhere. Um, such examples were all too common following the dramatic violence of the First World War. And in some cases, these structures were prefabricated, uh, designed by the modernist architect Fred Forbat. So um, similarly, the modern mass housing complexes of the 30s that I mentioned earlier, um, reflect many of the ideas echoed and discussed in the Siam Congress, the modern Siam Congress in Athens that took place in 1933. So we, we see in these modern mass housing units uh, new ideas regarding domestic space, individuality, privacy, functionality. Um, these are, um, are all reflected in uh, these um, new housing units. Of course, in these last latter typologies that I've been mentioning, um, the refugee has a less um, and less ability to intervene in space, to expand and to subdivide. So if you like, uh, the better the quality, the less is the ability of the refugee to intervene and to make their own spaces. Um, and now this, this built stock, um, the new construction for refugees, which much of which survives all over the country, is both refugee heritage, it's a heritage of um, interwar and post-war modernism, and, but also it's um, a heritage that testifies to the interventional capacity of the welfare state, an issue that is still very hot and current uh, in an era of successive crises and pandemics. 
So when discussing the population exchange and the refugee settlement, it's um, important to consider uh, the capacity of the state and the welfare state to intervene. Um, now, a third typology, and I'm um, moving towards the end, a third typology is self-help housing, um, which was encouraged and supported by the state after 1930. A new legislation allowed for um, refugees to organize themselves in um, uh, building associations. And this is also important to consider because we usually um, perceive the refugees as um, powerless victims, but they presented an extremely, um, you know, extreme flexibility and capacity to negotiate, to claim their rights and to request better living conditions. So after the 30s, many of them organized in building associations and benefiting from this legislation, they were given land in which they built their houses in, with their own means or with financial uh, support from the state. Now, it's an interesting that large neighborhoods of Athens and Piraeus and Thessaloniki and elsewhere were constructed, the city fringes were, were constructed with self-help housing, but this uh, housing, this, this refugee heritage does not have a distinct form. We, do, we cannot recognize something refugee-like, if you want, in these uh, neighborhoods. Um, so there's a question mark here, what is heritage and what is not, and what, what kind of form do we expect a, a refugee heritage to have? And I, I, last but not least, perhaps first of all, this could be the first typology of all, we, we must not forget the vast slums uh, that um, were constructed all over the country. This is also in a way self-help housing, but without any help from the state. Uh, the refugees um, used, took up any space, any public space or even private space that they could, uh, that they could in order, and built slums with um, their own means. None of these, however, survived today. So to conclude, um, what I would like to uh, point out today is that uh, we have, we still have today a very large built stock um, that relates to the population exchange and testifies to the tremendous footprint, to the tremendous impact that it had uh, in both countries. Um, newly constructed residential and other infrastructures constitute a heritage both related to this displacement, but also to the history of modernization and to the history of the welfare state. Um, and some of them are recognizable as such, but others uh, do not. Um, and second, the exchange properties, which were legally and physically transformed into refugee housing, are also the relics of the other side's displacement and allow for a wider consideration of the refugee experience as a double uh, post-conflict or cross-border heritage. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, Bruce, we'll turn it over to you. Hello, hello. Uh, very good to be with you. I happen to be in Venice at the moment, but uh, that seems to be a perfectly good place to participate in this conversation. Um, uh, I, 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 I will try responding uh, as a bit spontaneously to the last couple of speakers. Um, in response to Ayhan Akhtar, I would say that I consider the term ethnic cleansing entirely legitimate and factual and descriptive. Um, but it seems to me that what is what really stands out about the agreement on, on population exchange um, is that this was um, a, a, an act of sort of mutual ethnic cleansing, if you like, um, in which the two governments were, from their own point of view, reinforcing one another. Um, this was, so to speak, a trading of favours. Um, now, obviously, you know, victorious Turkey was in a much stronger position than defeated Greece. But nonetheless, in the in the calculus of relations between states, um, this was perceived at the time, and I think through the 20s and 30s, as an act of 
mutual goodwill in a certain perverse way um, in in the sense that uh, you know from the sort of strategic Greek point of view um, the fact that the Turkish government was willing so to speak to withdraw and take under its aegis uh, the mo Muslim population of Greece um, it well for, for one thing at a practical level it freed up space and property in Greece for the newcomers to occupy um, and it also it it, um, it lent legitimacy to the whole process, including in the eyes of the Orthodox Christians arriving in Greece. They were they found it easier to accept their fate uh, in view of the fact that you know, the other side were suffering this as well. Um, so, th so in 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 the deadly calculus of relations between nation states, this was uh, a case of two states, two governments, two regimes if you like reinforcing one another um and i think that, that maybe that is that hasn't been explicitly said in the conversation so far um i i i i've been thinking recently about parallels uh, between uh, in, in greece and turkey with respect to the reception of the newcomers on each side of the of the, of the aegean um i think in in in, in both cases you can see that the the the, the newcomers uh, they were entering countries um, in which the sort of so-called nation-state ideology was very well entrenched and indeed gaining strength, um, and their fate was very much determined by the strength of, of that ideology and the way it strengthened in some ways even further during the 1930s. Um, just uh, you know, s s speaking initially about the the, the, the Greek side of things. Um, let, it, I think it's, it's conceptually helpful to think of sort of assimilation or the failure of assimilation happening in three stages. Um, it seems to me that, you know, well, one possible state of affairs when a wave of newcomers arrive is for the existing population to say, we don't want you, you're aliens, you're outsiders, and whatever you do, we don't want you. And so don't even try adapting to us because we'd rather you hadn't come. That's sort of an extreme form of rejection, uh, which is in, 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 a, in a way not not far off what one part, one segment of the Greek population felt uh, in response to the Asia Minor refugees arriving. Now, uh, f phase two, if you like, uh, is the state of affairs where the established population says, uh, yes, um, uh, you can be accepted here, but only on condition of abandoning all characteristics which make you distinctive. In other words, you have to buy into uh, the culture, the norms, the legal borders uh, of the pre-existing population. And uh, on that basis, uh, you can find your place in the new state. And in a sense, that was the bargain um, that the refugees in Greece were offered by the Metaxas regime. And you know, to many of them, uh, it, it, it must have been welcome. Uh, and indeed, many of them did welcome it in the sense that, you know, there was there was a, an intensive program to oblige people to learn Greek, uh, to forget whatever dialect they spoke, to forget Turkish, uh, adults as well as children. Uh, and this was kind of a grand national bargain under which, yes, you could be accepted, but only on condition of forgetting everything that made you distinctive. Now, stage three, hypothetically, of assimilation, characteristic of liberal states, is to say, yes, you can be here, uh, and, and, and you can also retain some of your distinctive characteristics um, uh, and still be part of the family. Now, if that happened at all in Greece, it happened way into the post-war era, uh, really perhaps not even until you know the the the, you know, the, the post colonels area the uh, post 74 did you no know, uh, did it become legitimate in greece to say yes i am of anatolian origin and that makes me different from uh, other people in greece uh, you know i have for example a pontic greek dialect which is different from standard greek uh, and i celebrate that um, and it doesn't in any way diminish my right to remain in greece i'm part of the greek cultural commonwealth if you like and a part of, part of the community of people who have a right to be in Greece. So you know, there, there, are, there are three possible stages in assimilation. And, and, and I wonder to what extent, uh, as a hypothetical question, you could apply that, that, uh, that, that model to, to Turkey as well. Um, something that strikes me as common to both countries is that um, in, in each case, the community of exchangees 
uh, was caught up in a much wider homogenization drive. Um, and in fact, they were never the main problems in that drive. So if you look at sort of from the Greek state's point of view in the 1930s, um, I mean, the real challenges to homogeneity came from the Slavophone population, came from the Albanian Cham population. Uh, it was not, and it, from a strategic Greek point of view, uh, say that, for example, the Turkophone uh, Orthodox Christian migrants were considered a relatively minor problem. Why? Because it was already foreordained that they would learn Greek fairly quickly uh, and that they would be absorbed into the Greek mainstream fairly quickly. After all, they had nowhere else to go. And, uh, you know, there was, in, in a sense, in the long run, there was no reason to worry about them. Whereas there were other challenges to homogeneity, uh, which might actually, uh, you know, pr prove much more threatening to the... And from the point of view of the homogenizers, you know, the, 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 the Turkophone or partly Turkophone newcomers to Northern Greece um, were perceived as a strategic asset uh, in Hellenizing the region and reducing the influence of the Slavs. So in a sense, there is no particular surprise in the fact that, you know, there are people uh, who welcome our friend Akhan Naktar in Northern Greece uh, and are also invested in Greek nationalism uh, because the, 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 the whole point of Lausanne is to create a weird kind of convergence between certain Greek nationalist and certain Turkish nationalist agendas. Now, on the Turkish side, which you know, I, I, I speak of more hesitantly, seems to be that also, I mean, the, the Lausanne exchanges were a fairly small community uh, within the wider universe of people who had only recently entered the borders of the Turkish Republic and were sort of divergent in some sense or other, whether by whether by religion or language or culture or whatever. Um, and, 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 and there again, they were perceived as a relatively minor problem uh, in the sense, you know, there, there was the so-called Citizen Speak Turkish campaign um, in the 1930s, it had an official dimension, it had an, an, an unofficial dimension. And as far as I'm aware, um, you know, the existence of, say, Greek speaking Cretans uh, in places like Ivalik um, was never considered a particular problem in that campaign, uh, in the sense that it was assumed that, that within a generation they would learn Turkish and conform to the Turkish mainstream uh, and you know, there the, the, the will be nothing more to worry about, so to speak, from the point of view of the homogenizers, whereas there were other populations, including the Ladino-speaking Jews, who were considered more stubborn opponents of linguistic homogeneity. Um, and so the, the, the Citizens Speak Turkish campaign was sort of at least as much uh, directed, directed against them. So on the two sides of the Aegean, you have communities that were caught up in a in a in, in a maelstrom of you know homogenizing uh, pressure, which was actually much much bigger than you know their own particular problems. I mean, on the Greek side, um, I think that uh, that that 1930 was clearly a, a watershed, but maybe not exactly for the reasons that most people give. I mean, it's you know, conventional wisdom holds, and it's partly true, that when there was a strategic you know, diplomatic alliance was struck between Greece and Turkey, and as a result, the issue of financial compensation was set aside, and many of the refugees in Greece sort of lost hope of getting financial uh, compensation, that in, in their disappointment, um, many of them uh, abandoned Venizelos and, um, uh, and began voting for the Communist Party. And certainly, you know, as a proportion of communist voters, uh, the refugee share was significant, although you know, the communist movement as a whole was quite small in Greece, in, in, in the totality of Greece, it's strong in certain parts of northern Greece. Uh, and you know, within that movement, the refugees were clearly you know, a significant element. That's 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 and indeed in the Communist Party's own history of, uh, of, of, of its record in the 1930s. You know, the point is emphasized that we were the only party that refused to make this sort of arbitrary cultural distinction between local people and refugees. And the refugees liked us for that and they began voting for us in increasing numbers. So that's in a sense, part of the, part of the Communist Party law. But there's another part of the story, which is that a significant numbers of the refugees moved rightwards in politics as well. Um, and indeed, you know, uh, Calliope mentioned the, you know, the modernist architecture around Alexandros Avenue, um, which was considered, you know, a great sort of generous 
gesture to the refugees at the time. I mean, that you know, that reflects um, the, uh, the the, the right-wing Marabathans who then served as a minister of, of uh, under Metaxas, you know, Gotsias, uh, making his own gesture of goodwill to the refugees and making his own effort to actually scoop the refugees up and make them part of his political constituency. So you know, through through the 20s, it was taken as read that the refugees were all kind of the shock troops of Venezuelos and therefore bitterly resented by people in other parts of the political spectrum. Uh, from 1930 onwards, uh, in a sense, you know, I mean, all, all parts of the spectrum, ideological spectrum, were competing for refugee votes. Uh, and that, in a sense, you know, was an important step towards the legitimizing of the refugee presence in Greece. Uh, the, 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 they were voters for whom everybody could you know, legitimately uh, compete and woo. Um, and so and no, no, nobody was saying, you know, they should just be thrown out of Greece because they're not our people. On the contrary, they were, they were people to, to, um, to compete for. Um, I, 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 I'll end by um, telling a story about a friend of mine, uh, the very well-known sort of historian, radio journalist, Mariana Coromila, um, who remembers that in the 1970s, early, you know, sort of, it would have been uh, sort of shortly after the fall of the Junta, she um, uh, uh, made a television, made a radio program about, you know, in Greek parlance, the Asia Minor heritage, um, and it, it was the only time in her career uh, at sort of at the, at the Greek state broadcaster um, that she was actually called in by the director of ERT and sort of uh, put through a very, very serious discussion as to whether this was the right thing to do or not. Uh, and indeed, you know, the program was eventually blessed and it was a kind of landmark and it's still remembered as an important sort of watershed in Greek broadcasting. Now, why was it controversial? Here's the thing. Um, it was controversial because um, uh, in, in right-wing circles, in right-wing Greek circles, um, to emphasize the Asia Minor heritage is, you know, can be seen as a left-wing statement because actually so many of Greece's left-wing and indeed communist intellectuals have been of Asia Minor heritage. Um, and then in left-wing circles, to emphasize Asia Minor, uh, you know, can be seen as, um, or could be, could then be seen as, you know, a gesture of you know, right-wing irredentism. It was implying that we ought to be taking those territories back. Um, and so both for right and left, for different reasons, almost diametrically imposing reasons, uh, you know, the, the, uh, raising sort of, you know, the Asia Minor issue on the state broadcaster was as late as the 70s, you know, a highly controversial thing to do, uh, and sort of only, you know, perhaps uh, uh, only from 1981 onwards, you know, in the era of Papandreou, did sort of uh, refugee culture and the distinctiveness of the refugees and the distinctive, for example, of Ponte Greek culture become a thing that sort of political parties could compete over um, and, and could compete to, you know, to, to celebrate. So it was a very long process to get to the point of not only sort of acceptance and, assimil and, and, and assimilation, but acceptance of difference as well. Um, now, the point's been made that the um, that you know, the refugee voice was heard in literature on both sides of the GN, and that's that's a very important point. So um, you have them in 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 in, in, in Greece. You know, the great watershed was the novel Aeoliki Yi by Venezis, which appeared giving an idyllic account of life in Anatolia you know, in, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and that appeared sort of, you know, in the depths of the German occupation of Athens. So it was a kind of, you know, it, it was a, it was a, a dose of comfort or balm, if you like, for, you know, for a, for a suffering nation and, 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 and enormously resonant. But a couple of the sort of other most important novels uh, on that theme didn't appear till the early 60s. Um, uh, so, you know, the, 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 the emergence in literature of the, the, the open expression of the Asia Minor heritage took a very, very long time. Um, and so perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that it, you know, the, the, the equivalent uh, sensibility in Turkish literature also took um, a, a very long time to emerge. So anyway, that's, that, those are the thoughts I had to share. And we look forward to some, some questions and discussion. All right, thank you very much to all of our panelists. We already have some questions from the audience. I'm gonna ask those now. Again, if anyone has more questions, uh, events at lamf.gr. 
Uh, two questions I want to combine here for all of our panelists, uh, both touch on the scope of the exchange and who was included in it. Uh, the first question is, were Muslim Albanians of Greece and Armenians and or other Christian groups included in the population exchange process? And I'll add myself, if not, why? Uh, a second question, how does the fate of those who escape the exchange, i.e. minorities in Western Thrace, uh, in Istanbul, in Imbros and Tenedos, shed light on the agreement? So I will open that up to all of our panelists. Does anyone want to, uh, does anyone want to jump in and take either of those? Ah, yes. My guy. Uh, may I try to give an answer? Okay. Uh, no. Uh, Albanian Muslims were not included. They were regarded as um, belonging to a different nation, not the Turkish nation. Uh, the Armenians were not included. The, the, the convention says that the people who would be changed were Turkish citizens of Greek of the Greek Orthodox religion, and the Armenians belonged technically uh, to a different church. Uh, Greek Orthodox Armenians, I'm afraid, I think they were exchanged, but there were not that many. Uh, now, the the uh, the fact that the two minorities remained, the Muslim one in Thrace and the Greek one in Istanbul and Divros and Tenedos. Uh, by the way, they, the, the convention does not use the term Greek Orthodox for the uh, Greek community of Istanbul. It says the Greeks of Istanbul, probably because there were others who could be considered Greek Orthodox, like Serbs, uh, who should not be exchanged. Uh, now, the reason for this was that the, the, the Greek uh, side, Venizelos himself in the Lausanne negotiations, insisted very strongly that the ecumenical pat patriarchate should remain in Istanbul and therefore it should have a flock. And as, an, um, as a way to offset the fact that this community remained in one place, the other, commu the other minor community remained in Western Thrace as well. Thank you for that. Do any of the other participants have anything to add to this? Yes. Could, could, yes. Uh, yes. Could, could I say that, yes, I mean, I think that from the moment that the parties convened in, in, in Lausanne, I mean, the fate of the Greeks of Istanbul was, it was anticipated to be you know, one of the hottest issues. Because uh, uh, th th there was already sort of a, 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 an agreement in principle to move towards something like a population exchange. And that had been sort of brokered by Fritjof Nansen of the, of the League of Nations you know, before they even sat down in Lausanne. Um, but the, um, you know, the, the the Greek state was 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 terrified, frankly, that if you know there was a mass exodus of Greeks from Istanbul, uh, that you know the numbers would be uncontrollable. Of course, you know the loss of property and assets under Greek control would be would be massive. But but above all, you know it it would be you know it would add maybe a, you know a couple of hundred thousand. Uh, to, to, to the number of people, and so, so you know it it could have just broken. Uh, the Greek state almost, and um, and then you know, gradually a trade-off emerged, uh, you know, between Istanbul and and and, and Western Thrace. Um, so I mean, I know with regard to Cappadocia, uh, that's that's another sort of, um, in a sense, an, an, a surprising inclusion. Uh, in that, if you look at the records of the Lausanne conference as of the beginning of January, it was assumed by all parties that the Cappadocian Christians would be excluded from the exchange. A month later, uh, they are included. Um, I would actually argue that the um, the decision to retain the patriarchate uh, in its home city uh, made it more likely that the Cappadocians would be expelled. And I'll tell you why. Because you know, from the Greek point of view, um, having Cappadocian Christians deep in Anatolia would have created an arrival potential flock for the you know, the maverick figure of Papa Efteem, who was being set up by the Turks to undermine the patriarchate. Um, and you know, from the Turkish point of view, um, having Cappadocian Christians uh, deep in Anatolia remaining there would have actually created an extra flock for the ecumenical patriarch. So, in a sense, once once the patriarchate was allowed to stay, 
uh, it became more likely, I would suggest, that the, that the Cappadocian Christians were uh, forced to leave. Thank you. Any further thoughts on this? If not, I'll move on to the next question. This is for Dr. Amagdalu. Uh, how were abandoned buildings treated in both Greece and Turkey? Uh, and I specifically want to add here too, uh, specifically religious architecture. Uh, how were churches, mosques uh, used, preserved, not preserved by both sides? Uh, and maybe what does this tell us about the way the exchange and the populations involved were remembered and were treated? Uh, abandoned, um, do you mean the abandoned uh, or left behind at the time or abandoned in the long term after the population exchange? Could you, could you get a sense of what the question means? I assume they mean buildings that were abandoned as a result of the exchange. As a result. Well, um, in both cases, they were largely, largely re-inhabited by incoming refugees and public buildings, communal buildings such as churches and schools were also reused. Um, churches were usually um, often, not, not usually, but often uh, turned into mosques. In the area that we're working on in our research project, we see that many churches, in many villages, the churches were demolished rather than reused. So we see both uh, attitudes, uh, both things happening at the same time. In one village, uh, the mosque is, it's turned into a mosque in the village down the street, down the road, it's uh, demolished. So it, it, um, it changes from place to place. It's important to point out that um, and uh, my co-panelists already know this and they have pointed it out in their own work. Um, the Muslim refugees were lucky enough to move um, later uh, in the course of the events, but they were unlucky in the sense that by the time they uh, tried to settle in the designated places, uh, the houses and uh, buildings that were supposed to belong to them had been um, destroyed or um, looted by other local by local populations. Um, so for, for sometimes for good reasons, sometimes not. I mean, uh, areas such as Izmir uh, we, on which we're working were on the corridor of the war. So many villages, many Muslim villages uh, were burned and destroyed because of the war. So there were many people in need for housing that were not exchanged. They were local populations that were in need of, of housing as well. Uh, so the moment the Greek uh, refugees left, many of their houses were taken over by the locals before the Muslim refugees from uh, Greece uh, arrived. Uh, in other cases, of course, it's just instances of looting or even uh, appropriation by upper classes or by people that had means, political means. Uh, we, we have uh, instances where uh, local um, uh, Turks managed to get, uh, to appropriate and to own a, a series of um, um, Greek properties or Armenian properties uh, because of uh, close connections to the governor or the government. So we have many different fates, I would say. Uh, regarding the buildings that were left behind. In Greece as well, in Greece, there was not an abundance of um, um, exchange properties, so most of them were reused. In Greece, we have the opposite um, situation. Greeks arrive and the Turks haven't left yet. So in, we have stories in which Turkish families are forced to live together with the incoming Greek family between 1922 and 1924 when they leave for Turkey, um, right? So uh, in the same house, they are forced to hand out, to give out one of the rooms of the house or a couple of the rooms in the house to a Greek family, uh, which will uh, eventually take over their, their home. Um, I don't have many examples. So I, I cannot think of many different fates um, on the Greek side. Perhaps other people can help with this. But on the, Turkey, on the Turkey side, I must add that we also have many villages that were never uh, inhabited by incoming Muslim refugees. So, there in, for example, in the Izmir area, in the Karaburun area, we have many old Greek villages and, and in other areas as well. 
uh, that are still there. They're, um, they were never taken over economically. It didn't make sense to uh, settle there. Um, and uh, they still stand there abandoned. I hope I, I answered somehow. Thank you, yes. Uh, does anyone else want to share any thoughts on this? If not, then let me ask what I think is in some ways an unfair question, but an unavoidable one. Uh, historians in talking about history have an understandable aversion to any kind of alternate history, to talking about what the, how things could have gone differently if different decisions had been made. Although I think hanging over every discussion of the population exchange is a very much unstated uh, set of assumptions about what the alternative was. I think for people who see the alternative to the exchange uh, as minority religious populations continuing to live uh, in harmony in multi-ethnic secular states, uh, that assumption drives, uh, adds to the horror of the exchange. Uh, conversely, I think for people who imagine that the alternative to what happened was something much closer to you know, the partition in uh, India, something much closer to the Nakba, something in which essentially the results are the same with much more violence, much more death in the process, it's easier to see the exchange as a lesser evil. Um, so with the caveat that of course we can't know what the alternative was, I'm interested in how people uh, think about that, how we think about making sense of this, you know, what was ultimately a political and diplomatic decision in light of assumptions about the alternative. Uh, Professor Akhtar. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. This is this is uh, this is something a white elephant in the room. Uh, people are talking about exchange, but you know they don't want to speculate about the alternative uh, uh, solutions. Uh, in my opinion, alternative solution was rather impossible because of the nature of Turkish and Greek nationalisms. Uh, you know, uh, anyone who has been to United States or United Kingdom would see the difference between American type of nationalism and the Turkish or Russian or the Greek one. Uh, the US type of nationalism permits hyphenated identities. I mean, you can say Japanese American. Nobody raises an eyebrow. I mean, no problem with that. Armenian American, Greek American. Turkish American. But when you translate that thing into Turkish, can you say uh, Greek Turk? You know, it, it's different. It's something like uh, mutually exclusive. I mean, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a definition which is uh, uh, problematic in the, in the first pronunciation. Or can you say Turkish Greek? No, you cannot. I mean, uh, both countries adopted the same type of nationalism, which is more European, no doubt. And uh, if you try to establish a new state with this type of nationalism, then it is difficult. I mean, population exchange, as Bruce said, I mean, I implied that uh, a mutual ex ethnic cleansing seems to be the only solution. Uh, but the, the important thing is this, has the population exchange brought peace to Middle East or Turkish-Greek relations? That's an important thing. I mean, I would like to remind you, to all of you, the famous incident of Emir Kardak, uh, you know, 20 to 25 years ago, there was a silly rock on the Aegean close to the Turkish coast, and there was only uh, two dozens of goats there. And because of that silly thing, Turkey and Greece were in, on the, uh, came to the brink of war, all right? I mean, and think about the issues diplomats are still discussing nowadays. I mean, uh, how Greeks violated Lausanne, how Turks violated Lausanne and this and that. Uh, think about the irony or the agony of these uh, two existing uh, minorities. I mean, according to 1927 population census in Turkey, we had about 115,000 Greeks 
in Istanbul, in Imros and Tenedos. Okay, how many we have now? 2,000. And nearly 60% of them are over 50 years old. And the, the, I mean, the concept of reciprocity, doing terrible things to each other, each other's communities, minorities, was a way of life for the Turkish and Greek diplomats. I mean, this went on for uh, for a long time. Yes, population exchange was told to be a viable solution, but after 100 years, we realized that it's not a solution at all. I mean, either nation states try to formulate certain modus vivendi for the minorities to exist and coexist with the majority, or permanent state of war. That's what we have. And uh, I mean, both sides will apply to United States for buying new toys. I mean, F-19s bombarding jets or something like that. This will, this will be the way of life for both sides. Uh, this, is the, this is the important thing. I mean, population is not only. It also means that to talk about criticize our forms of nationalism permit to hyphenated identities. Okay, that, that seems to be the problem. I better stop here. Thank you so much. I think we unfortunately are out of time. There's much more that we could discuss. Again, I wanna thank all of our panelists and both panels for joining us. Um, and let me turn it over. Yanis, do you want to say anything in closing? I would like to join you in thanking panelists in both panels for a very interesting, in my opinion, at least discussion. And uh, add that on this very important anniversary, on the centennial of the Mandatory Population Exchange Convention between Greece and Turkey, We've tried to put forward a discussion that sheds light on the people rather than only state interest, because I think this is a rather neglected side of the story. We normally talk about this from a top-down perspective, but it is important to add the human and the community dimension because this, this, this event has profoundly shaped the lives of millions of people and made Greece and Turkey very different countries. So thank you very much. And uh, please stay tuned for other events of the Turkey program that tries to look into important anniversaries of this year, because this year is going to be very uh, kind of linked to anniversaries in Greek-Turkish relations, also in Turkish politics. So we will plan similar activities to shed uh, light on these very important events. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.